The Sony ZV-1 is probably the most popular point-and-shoot camera for video in the YouTube community. And it has been out for a while now. I bought mine about 6 months ago, after using my RX100 Mark I for the past 6 years. At roughly 750 US dollars, it's quite expensive for a point-and-shoot camera, but then again, it does seem to pack a lot of punch. So might this camera be worth it for you? Let's find out in this video. As always, if you are only interested in certain aspects of this camera, feel free to use the timestamps in the description below. What's up YouTube? I've been an RX100 Mark I owner for about 6 years or so. I bought this back in 2015 when the Mark II and the Mark III were already available, but honestly I was a poor and broke university student and I couldn't afford the other models at the time, so this was all I could get. And I also only used this as a B camera to my main camera back then, which was a Canon 70D and I had a couple of lenses to go along with that. So this was my B camera I used to pretty much whip out and shoot some quick video shots and some quick photos and that I could simply hand off to my girlfriend or whoever to take some quick snaps and shots. And it has worked great for that, even though it has always been kind of a flawed camera and there were certain aspects of this camera that I could never seem to work around really. But anyway, about six months or so, I therefore upgraded to the Sony ZV-1, which has been released in 2020. And this is kind of a successor to the RX100 line of cameras, but also kind of a sidestep to that line because the RX100 line of cameras still exists. This is actually cheaper than the latest RX100 Mark I and also uses a different lens. And it has also been created, especially with vloggers and content creators in mind. So even though I don't actually consider myself to fall into that area, I like to carry this as a sort of B cam uh, or secondary camera to my Fuji cameras, especially my Fuji X100V, which I carry every day. And I use this to create memories, especially in video format, while the Fuji X100V is more of a photo shooter, even though it shoots great video as well. So, has this camera actually been able to live up to the hype that people on the internet have given it? And did it actually improve on the things that the RX100 Mark I, which is the first model obviously, did wrong? Well, in many areas, obviously, yes, this is a huge step up in a lot of regards, but also there are steps back and areas in which this is actually worse than the RX100 Mark I. So without any further ado, let's get into some details. I hope you like it. Kick back, make yourself a cup of coffee or tea and enjoy. So let's jump right into the action. The materials and build quality are actually one area where the ZV-1 is a clear step back from what the RX100 line used to be. Even my RX100 Mark I was made with a beautiful metal body that feels solid and has held up very well over time, despite being my daily companion throughout most of my time in university. Yes, the paint has been scratched off in certain areas, but I think that only adds to the character of this camera. With the ZV-1 on the other hand, you get a body that is made from some kind of plastic or polycarbonate. It's not the worst thing ever, but it certainly doesn't feel as high quality as the RX100 did. I'm not too fast in terms of longevity though, since the material has an overall similar feel to that of my DJI Osmo Action, which is just a tank of a camera. So while I personally miss the metal body, I appreciate the price cut compared to the current RX100 lineup. It's also lighter, so overall it might be a worthwhile trade for some. For me however, I would take the metal body any day of the week, even if it would cost me more. Speaking of materials, let's also quickly talk about the display. It's one of the ZV-1's party tricks because it is now finally a flip screen, so you can flip it out to shoot at weird angles or in full-on selfie mode. I obviously appreciate that this is a very useful feature, even though I personally preferred the flip screen from the old RX100 Mark III and onwards. But again, I think most people disagree with me here, so never mind. Also, while this is a touch screen, you can pretty much only use the touch functionality to select your focusing points, so I turned off that feature altogether. With that being said, the screen itself is not too bad. It's not the brightest and only moderately useful outside, but still, it gets the job done. Coming back to the build quality side of things, I am kind of worried because of the wobble I feel in the flip mechanism since day one. It's not the end of the world if it stays as it is, but it's not reassuring to say the least. Another aspect that this camera has gotten a lot of praise for is the built-in microphone. So first of all, you get a regular placeholder for your hot shoe mount, as well as the sweet dead cat right out of the box. I haven't actually tested the microphone in high wind conditions, but from what I could gather, the wind muff seems to actually work and reduce the wind noise pretty well. The overall audio quality is also decent enough for what it is in my opinion, and definitely a step forward from my RX100 Mark I. So thumbs up for the new microphone and wind muff. 
but let's get into the stuff that really matters. I use this camera primarily as a video camera for vlogging, as well as the occasional quick on the go shot for one of my YouTube videos. The overall image quality is good for what it is. I only think that some people oversell it a bit and make it look like it's on par with a Micro Four Third, APS-C or full frame camera. Let me tell you, it's not. At least not if you pair one of those cameras with a halfway decent lens. And that is okay in my book. This is a compromise of a camera. You sacrifice a bit of quality to gain portability. And the fact that people compare this to full on mirrorless or DSLR systems is a compliment in and of itself. The video quality is somewhat limited by only being able to record at a maximum of 100 megabits per second, but it's still a way more advanced image compared to what you can get from something like your iPhone. This is true in daylight situations, but especially in low light. With that being said, while the low light is, again, good for what it is, it's nothing out of this world. I try not to go anywhere beyond ISO 1600 if I don't absolutely have to. But alas, it's nice that I could if I ever needed to. And if you crank it up all the way to ISO 12800, you get a bit of that brighter than real life experience that so many of us seem to crave. One of this camera's quirks though, is that you can't set a minimum shutter speed while recording video in aperture priority mode. So if you get into a darker area, this camera will automatically drop the shutter speed way below 1 25th of a second and kill your fun. Don't know what they were thinking, but you better keep this in mind and use shutter priority or full on manual mode when you are working with less than optimal lighting conditions. One area I'm still not sure about are the colors. With picture profiles turned off, the colors look fairly pleasant, but you do of course lose a lot of detail in your shadows and highlights. With most flat profiles though, you lose too much color and saturation and it looks just plain wrong when you try to bring them back in post. I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to color grading, but I would say that for your average Joe, the color grade doesn't come natural or intuitively with the files from this camera at all. I have now resorted to shooting with picture profiles turned off after using a somewhat flat profile for a couple of weeks, but I am still not fully satisfied. Also, I can't seem to get rid of the magenta shift I get with this camera. Being a Fuji shooter, I am somewhat accustomed to colors not being accurate. But while the colors might not be completely accurate with my Fuji cameras, they are at least very pleasing to the eye in most situations. Not though with this camera, or at least not for me. I seriously don't want to rule out the possibility that I'm just doing something wrong here. So I won't go any farther into this, but again, the colors seem to be a huge weak spot of this camera, at least in my experience. The autofocus is reliable in most situations, with only occasional random malfunctions. Overall, it's perfectly usable for my vlogging and on-the-go filming needs. Another point of contention though is the stabilization. With this camera, you can select between having the stabilization all the way turned off, mechanical stabilization only and electronic stabilization mode. When stabilization is turned off, it's pretty much useless handheld, but with the lens stabilization turned on, it actually works quite well, at least as long as you don't move. It gets a little shaky while walking about, but that's just the way it is, I guess. The electronic stabilization, or active stabilization, as Sony likes to call it, also works really well, but it does come at a drawback, which is a significant prop into your image to give the camera enough room to compensate for your movements. Especially considering that a lot of reviewers thought that the minimum focal length of 24mm was not wide enough for a vlogging camera to begin with, this is just something that you have to keep in mind. You certainly gain some smoothness, so it definitely has its place and I'm glad that they put it in there, but you also lose some of your field of view. So pick your poison I guess. Speaking of crops, wanna shoot in 4K? Well, I got bad news for you, because 4K is also only possible with a significant crop. And yes, if you want to use active stape in 4K, it crops in even further. The 4K image itself is quite nice though, no doubt about it. And I also haven't had any overheating issues in case you were wondering. But since I tend to record a ton of footage with this camera, and the 1080p is also quite nice, but without the crop, I pretty much abandoned the 4K mode for the most part and only ever use it if I want to take a quick shot for one of my YouTube videos. The 24-70mm equivalent focal range this camera offers at aperture f1.8-2.8 is also rather nice in my opinion. Without the crop, I don't even think that the image is not wide enough at 24mm, but that is certainly subjective. You do get a good amount of distortion at 24mm in the outer areas of the image though. But again, there are prices to be paid for packing all of those features in such a small package. You can also get pretty close to your subject, which is nice, but that also comes with a certain amount of softness in the image. 
Aside from that, you can also use the ND filter while recording video, which makes life a bit easier, even though the ND is not strong enough to keep your shutter speed at twice your frame rate with the aperture wide open in broad daylight. So overall, with all its quirks and faults, it's still a case of best in its class as far as I know. Again, don't expect this to replace your DSLR or mirrorless system anytime soon, but it will give you image quality way beyond your iPhone in a package that you won't hesitate to bring with you wherever you go. Before I forget it, the ZV-1 also shoots photos, which are also great considering the size of this camera, but since I have pretty much not used this for taking photos, I don't really feel inclined to speak about it at length. I have been able to get great results from the RX100 though, and I would be shocked if this turned out to be less capable, so we'll leave it at that. In terms of how easy it is to use, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's slow to turn on and even slower to turn off. It's even slow compared to my RX100, which was released in 2013. The record button on the top also doesn't seem to work every time, so it has happened to me that I have been talking to the camera for several minutes before realizing that I was not actually recording. That is however also partly my fault, because this camera does come with a record light on the front. I also appreciate the big red video recording button and the way it's placed on top of the camera and more than that, I do think that the overall button layout and functionality is very nice with this camera. The menus are a bit cumbersome, but at least the quick menu works like a charm and comes in handy all the time. The file system this camera uses to store your images and videos however sucks. I am already used to it because it's basically the same stupid system they were using back in the day with my Mark 1 RX100, but for goodness sake, who wants this? I think it's time to improve and there's just no excuse here. But then again, it's not the end of the world. It's just one more quirk to go along with. In terms of accessories, I also did get this vlogging tripod for free from the camera store I bought the ZV-1 from. Which is nice, because I probably would have never considered buying this tripod with my own money. It's a nice gimmick though, it's compact and sturdy enough and offers a bit of functionality when it's paired up with the ZV-1. Again, not sure if I would recommend buying it, since the build quality is somewhat questionable and the price is fairly steep, but it's still nice to have. The batteries are also the same that I already had for my RX100. And there are third party batteries available for dirt cheap, which is a godsend, considering that this camera burns through your battery in no time flat. There are also aftermarket solutions to mount filters on the lens. I had one on my RX100, but haven't installed any on my ZV-1 yet. But hey, at least that's an option. So overall, this camera has its fair share of quirks and flaws, and it's not the point and shoot to end all of your on-the-go video needs once and for all. But with that being said, it's probably still the best option out there, at least for now. And despite of all of its shortcomings, I have never once regretted buying it, and I'm happy to have it with me in my everyday carry bag. I stopped using the RX100 a long while ago, because the video quality simply didn't hold up for me anymore. But carrying my Fuji XT30 everywhere was just too much of a hassle and too much friction. So I ended up not getting the shot and not recording those valuable memories. Since I bought this camera though, I have recorded hours of our daily life. Most of it will probably never mean anything to anyone else, but I have recently looked through old video footage from the past years with my girlfriend and just realized how valuable these memories of friends, family and travel become, especially in times like these. So I am glad that I now have the ZV-1 to once again fulfill most of my on-the-go video needs. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about the ZV-1 in the comments below. Until next time, take care.